welcome to session three on Are There Two Powers in Heaven? Again, we are hitting the topic of monotheism today. And monotheism, in its basic terminology, is, is defined as the belief in one God. And we know this is a, a sacred belief to, to Jewish people, to Muslims, and to Christians. But can I tell you that when we look at the idea of monotheism, we have a father... Uh, hearing prayers from his son and a son praying to his father. We remember Jesus prayed to his father. He talked to his father. And if we're going to identify with monotheism, we need to ask the question, what do we do with Jesus? Uh, we have Yahweh, who we know throughout the Old Testament, is the father, is the, the God of the Old Testament. And the thesis of this entire course is that the Jews in the times of Jesus and prior to the destruction of the temple affirmed that there was a second power in heaven, that Yahweh had a God license and Jesus had a God license. But if we are going to believe this and address this issue, we have to address the elephant in the room, and that is monotheism, the definition of one God. I call this strict monotheism, that there's no room for Jesus. Can Jesus have a God license and the Father have a God license and we have monotheism? So that's what I want to address uh, this issue today. Talk a lot about the Shema, uh, Deuteronomy 6.4. Talk about the meaning of the word Echad, which means uh, one in the Hebrew language. And um, as we go through this uh, to address you know, what are the issues that are at hand? Because when you look into the, the Jewish faith, now after the temple was destroyed in 70 AD, um, maybe you don't realize when Jesus came to the planet, he came, came here uh, and he died in about the year 30, 33 um, AD. And then about 40 years later, the temple was destroyed. Now the temple to the Jews at this time was their central uh, position, their, their, it was, the temple was the center of their faith. It would be as if the, the Catholics lose, lost the Pope. I mean, for, for them to have no temple anymore after 70 AD, Judaism then changed. Judaism became different at this point. We call it uh, rabbinical Judaism from after the temple is destroyed till today. And prior to that, we call it Temple Judaism, because this is Judaism without the temple. Now, when the, the early Christians, all of the early Christians were Jewish people. We would call them Messianic Jews today, or Jews who identify as Jewish, but they believed or they affirmed that Jesus was the Messiah. And when we look into the belief system, is what we're doing in this course, of how were the Jews thinking at this time prior to the temple being destroyed? Did they actually believe that there was another power in heaven besides Yahweh and them, in, in, besides Yahweh himself? And so there was actually the term of two powers in heaven was, was later deemed as a heresy by the Jewish leadership, by the rabbinical Jews, this, that basically they, they backed away from this belief. No, we never believe this. We don't believe this. This is a heresy to believe that there was two powers in heaven. Um, and this came later after the temple was destroyed. And the reason I believe this happened is because Jesus fit this role of the other power in heaven like a hand fits into a glove. And so we'll address that today in this session. And I want to read... What Jesus himself said was the greatest commandment or the most important one. And to the Jewish people, you're going to find that this statement is called the Shema. Now, the Shema in the Hebrew language means to hear and to obey. You, when you heard something, you obeyed it. Uh, if you study the difference between a Greek mindset and a Hebraic mindset, the Hebrews were more about hearing and, and hearing and feeling what God was saying but as the church later developed more with a Greek mindset, it became more focused on what is seen than what is heard. So the, the Shema is uh, in the Hebrew. It would be Shema Israel Adonai Elohim Adonai Echad. 
And uh, in, the, in the English, it would be, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is, is God and the Lord is one. Now, in the translation that I use, and the translation called the name Translation Bible that I put together is a translation that was based on the World English Bible, and the World English Bible and the name Translation Bible both use the name Yahweh instead of what we call the Tetragrammaton. And this is a, a, a term that just means the four letters of God's name. God's name is spelled yud heh vav -Hey. It's a four letters. Uh, one, of, one of the most beautiful things about the name of Yahweh, I think, is because um, Moses, we know, had a stuttering problem. And people stutter because of the consonants. Uh, the consonants, not the vowels, but they stutter over the consonants. When you say the word Yahweh, it's actually a, a declaration that has no consonants in it. There's, so Moses could say Yahweh without stuttering. I think that's a, a beautiful picture. But in most translations, you're going to see the name of Yahweh translated not as a name, but as a title. And what I have found happen is you begin to lose the distinction between Yahweh and Jesus. And this is what I do not like to see happen when it comes to translation. When we, when we mistranslate the Hebrew word, those four letters called uh, of God's name, and we change them into a title, I believe that we're going to lose clarity in what we believe. And there's nothing in the Bible that tells us or warns us that we should not use the name of Yahweh. Though Jewish tradition later began to, uh, whenever the name of Yahweh was found in the scriptures, they would replace it with the word Hashem, which means the name, or they would use the title Lord. And they did not want to, to pronounce the name of God, which was Yahweh. And I disagree with this. Uh, I think we can see, number one, when you study names, there's over 40,000 names in the Bible. And I translated the meaning of every one of those names. Uh, there's about 3,500 different names. <laughs> but most of the names in the Bible have the name of Yahweh in their names. One of, my, one of the most interesting names, I think, is Ahijah, which, uh, or Ahijah, and this, this name actually means that Yahweh is my brother. I thought, wow, that's, that's pretty relational. Like, Yahweh is my bro. I mean, that, to name your child, uh, Yahweh is my brother. And then for the Jewish people to say, oh, no, uh, we can't translate God's name in the Bible because his name is too holy to say or we shouldn't say it. But we say hallelujah. Yah is... Hallelu, Hallel means to praise you, praise you, Yah. Yah is like Yahweh's nickname, or they'd say, I wouldn't say it's another name for Yahweh, it's his nickname. And if we're saying Hallelujah, then we're saying his name and to, to banish us or not allow us to say the name or to take it out of translations, in my humble opinion, I believe it's a mistake. I believe we can do better. And I've had a lot of, uh, I've had some Messianic Jewish people who won't read the name translation Bible because I actually use the name of Yahweh. But uh, to me, that's the, one of the most important benefits of reading the name, name translation Bible. It's called the TNT Bible uh, and, uh, because it's the most powerful translation. No, I just made that up. But it, uh, it, using God's name is important. Now, Interesting enough, when you look at the history of the name of Yahweh, when I translated his name, I translated it as Jealous One. Most scholars would have translated it as the existent one or the, the one that caused existence. Uh, it, basically from the, the root, the Hebrew root word, which means to be. And I think that's a decent translation. But um, interestingly, when you look into the, the scriptures, Exodus 34, 14, do not worship any other God for Yahweh, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. So there's precedence in scripture that, that Yahweh identifies himself as a jealous God. One who, just like 
if any other man looks at my wife or would uh, you know, send my wife flowers or candy or uh, text her constantly, um, there would be jealousy in my heart because we are in covenant together. And so I see not only is the name Jealous One for Yahweh theologically correct, like that's who he is, um, it also, there's, there's biblical precedence that God says that for Yahweh, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. He is jealous for us. And I want you to meditate on that for just a moment. We think jealousy is a term of weakness, but in scriptural terms, jealousy is a term of covenant. You belong to me. When you look at another in, in the same way you don't look and in, in you treat, when you look at someone else, in the way I want you to long for me, I am jealous. That's how a person in covenant behaves. So we'll find that here we have the Shema, which is the most famous verse in the Old Testament, that God, that Yahweh is God, Yahweh is one. Now, what does the word one mean in Hebrew? It's actually the word echad, and echad means to uh, to be to be one. The first time that this scripture is found is found in Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. And it says, For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united as, with his wife, and they will become one flesh. They will become echad. So we have this picture here that, that God is declaring, I am echad. And I believe this is a term of covenant. Its first mention is in Genesis 2.24, between a man and a wife, that they, that they shall become one. What I like to say is, my wife's name is Debbie. Uh, when we, because we are married, we are one flesh, we are echad. But don't call me Debbie and don't call her Chris because we are different individuals. So what we, so what we find here is that Yahweh... Takes, usually takes the title of God, and Jesus usually takes the title of Lord, but they are different individuals. And Jesus himself said, I and the Father are one, in John 17, to communicate that they are in covenant together. And you're going to find this statement in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 6. Here's the Apostle Paul writing to the Corinthian church. He says, there is but one God, the Father, from whom all things came and for whom we live. And there is but one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things came, through whom we live. We have a father, that's one power, and we have a son, that's the second power. But they can both have a God license. Again, the issue of confusion uh, comes in when we talk about God being a substance instead of a title. And this is where the Greek philosophical terms became uh, included into the early creeds. And this is language that's not used in the Bible. The Bible uses relational language, a father and a son, not, we call it, a subst I would call it substance language or philosophical language is what the Trinity is based upon. It's based upon more of a Greek mindset than it is a Hebraic mindset. And let me explain that to you. And this is one of the things I was very uh, specific when I came to the translation. Because you'll read, again, the most famous verse in the Old Testament for the Jewish people is Deuteronomy 6.4, the Shema. The most famous verse in the New Testament is John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. So let's look at the beginning of this verse. For God so loved the world. When translators translated the New Testament into English, there is no definite article before God. So we've used this word for, uh, it's not being translated as if it is a title. If it was a title, like if I was to put the title king in here, I wouldn't say for king so loved the world. I'd say for the king so loved the world or for our king so loved the world. That's how you would use a title. But if you were using a name, 
you wouldn't have any, we call them a definite article, which is the, uh, or an indefinite article, which is a or and, um, put prior to the noun. And uh, what we see happen is translators just dropped it. So you, when you say, for God so loved the world, you could say, for John so loved the world, or for Chris so loved the world. They treat the word God like a name without a definite article instead, or an indefinite article, instead of including that article, which is what I did in my translation, is I always prefaced the word God as with using the word are, for our, for our God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. So that even within our translations, we see it's been a, a difficulty. It's, it's easy for us to get lost because of the, the way the Bible has been translated. So uh, it was, it's been my heart to try to correct that and to go after that in the name translation Bible. Uh, you'll have to read it yourself or you know, you know, we'll see how people, uh, if people agree, but I feel like that's a very good uh, place to start. So when we look into, especially the book of Isaiah, because you're gonna find that there are some statements in the Old Testament that are, seem very monotheistic, I would call it strict monotheism. Look at Deuteronomy 4.35. It says, Yahweh is God, besides him, there is no other. You'll find this especially um, in Isaiah, the uh, chapter 40 to chapter 50. Uh, you'll see this continually. The, the, the prophet is crying out, is there any God besides me? No, there is no other rock. I know not one. And the prophet Isaiah is declaring, these are the words of of Yahweh. There is no God besides me. No, there is no other rock. So there's this continual expression in Isaiah, which a lot of Jews, and even Christians today will say, there you have it. God is one. There is no one like him and there's no one besides him. Now, interestingly, well, because sometimes when we're reading the scriptures, we, would, we, we don't understand translation and how there are statements that are made even in English. Now imagine that I take my daughter to New York City and I make the statement, there is no place like New York City. Is my daughter going to assume that in my mind, I suddenly believe that all other cities in the world suddenly disappeared and now New York City is the only city that remains? Of course not. So there are statements that are made in the Bible that we can take to the extreme or we can take it into that into the culture and realize Yahweh is not saying, listen, I'm the only one. There could never be another one like me. Well, does that exclude the person of Jesus Christ? I say absolutely not. When we look into the scriptures, we're going to see that the Jewish people believe, and we'll talk about this when we, especially when we talk about the angel of the Lord or angel uh, angel Yahweh or Melech Yahweh and you'll see that there is a uh, the this this angel or this sent one from Yahweh carries on the same personality and person of Yahweh but is different and this is where I believe most Christians fail is they began they, they begin to lose the distinction between the father and the son because they're so fearful of violating monotheism. And I have had to let go of monotheism, the strict monotheism that a lot of people think, no, we have to believe that there's only one God. Again, the term one, I believe, refers to covenant, not to number. When you're saying, especially you know, in, in the Aramaic culture, when you're saying, I am one with somebody, you're not, no, it doesn't mean you're no longer an individual, it just means you are with them. You're with them in heart and soul. And when Jesus said, you know, I and the Father are one, and then he prayed that we would all be one. It wasn't like we, then we all lose our distinction and we all become like God himself. I mean, that's utter foolishness to think that that's what Jesus meant when he talked about the idea of, of being one with the Father. It's one in spirit, like-minded. We're together on this. And this is 
This is the picture that we see that there really is one rule. There's one dynasty. There's Yahweh and his dynasty was continued on when his son took the throne. Now, I believe Jesus is the eternal son of God, but all authority in heaven and earth was given to him by the father. He is the other power in heaven. Jesus was not a created being. He is the other power in heaven that we should honor in the same way that Jesus, or the same way that Yahweh is honored, Jesus is honored. We bring pleasure to the Father when we honor Jesus. And I think that's what ultimately orthodoxy comes down to is your perception of Jesus. Do you honor Jesus the same way you honor the Father? Now, that's why I've said before that when uh, most of the church is a, a, holds to the Trinitarian belief, and in the Trinitarian belief, there, you honor the Father equally with the Son. There, there is no difference. Beautiful. Now you look into the, uh, the, the Jesus-only movement or the, the oneness Pentecostals. I've been to their churches as well. Uh, listen, to, to listen to their music. It's anointed. God's all over it. And I have to ask myself a question. Well, Trinitarians and Oneness Pentecostals believe different things, but God still shows up at both of these uh, gatherings. I mean, you feel the presence of God. And why is that? And I'd have to, when I had to narrow all this down, it's because Jesus is honored and Jesus is honored by the Oneness Pentecostals. Jesus is honored by the Trinitarians. It's like there's, Jesus is elevated. There's a high Christology. When we say Christology, it just means your belief in Christ. You see Jesus the same way you see the Father. And this is what I believe. And I believe when Jesus came to the planet 2,000 years ago, that the Jews of that time had this two power in heaven understanding that allowed Jesus to uh, be treated in the same way the Father was treated. So we look at these statements and we also look one of the first statements in the Bible that is used oftentimes to say, uh, you see, there is a plurality in God, and it's because of the word for God, which in the Hebrew is Elohim. And the, we can see that the word for God in Hebrew is Elohim. Elohim is a plural word. Now, people to say, well, you see right there we have more than one God. We, we see right there because uh, we have a plural word in the beginning, um, Elohim bara, or he created, which is a singular noun, or a, I'm sorry, there's a, a, a plural noun and then bara is a singular verb. So people often say there is the Trinity or there is more than one God mentioned in the word God. But we look into the word for um, sometimes when Hebrew, Hebrew words are plural, uh, there's the word im or the, pref or the ending sound im is added to the words. And so we can see the English word for trees is etzaim in the, in the Hebrew. Now etzaim is plural, but it can refer to a bunch of trees or it can refer to one big tree. That's an etzaim, that's a big tree. It's similar to the Hebrew word uh, behemoth, which is the plural of the word behemoth, which means beast. And so behemoth, which is a plural Hebrew word, can refer to uh, many beasts or one large beast. So uh, oftentimes, you know, in the English language, we add the letter S to make a noun plural in the Hebrew uh, because you have both male and, or yeah, male and female nouns and verbs. And so it gets a little masculine and feminine uh, nouns and verbs. It gets a little complicated, but uh, the, the um, ending im, the suffix im, what that will do is it'll make a Hebrew word plural, but it doesn't mean that it's making them more than one. So just because we see the word Elohim, and then God says, let's create man in our image. And if you've read some of Dr. Michael Heiser's work, uh, Psalm 82 talks about the divine assembly when, when Yahweh is making the declaration that, hey, I am, uh, let us make God in our image. He is not referring to just himself uh, as if he's some more than one being or more than one person, 
but he actually is referring, pulling into the council, the divine council with him and saying, let us make God in our own image. I um, also see that there are some odd oddities in uh, Ecclesiastes 12.1. It says, remember thy creators in the day of your youth. Uh, where is our God, my maker? So there's, there's some plural, if you were to translate these words into English, uh, instead of where is God, my maker, the actual Hebrew would be makers. Well, that's odd. Again, um, you'll find this in Ecclesiastes 12.1, Job 35.10, Psalm 149.2 says, let, a, let Israel rejoice in his makers. Again, a plural. Proverbs 9.10, the knowledge of the holy ones is understanding. And then Isaiah 54.5, your makers are your husband. So just some odd translations that you can look to yourself as I have and you know, well, what does this mean that these words are plural? Is it an inference of the Trinity? Is it an inference of, of God being more than one? Or is it just to declare that God is a big God? Again, this is something that you can study yourself and make some conclusions. And the last thing I want to talk about is the idea that many Christians believe that Yahweh is actually the Trinity. And I disagree with this statement. I disagree that Yahweh could be three persons. Um, and this is, this is where uh, I think I want to simplify, uh, I want to simplify what I believe is that Yahweh is the name of the Father. It's not, Yahweh is not the Father, Son, and the Spirit, but Yahweh is one individual, it's the Father. Jesus is one individual, and that's the Son, Jesus Christ. And then we'll talk about the Spirit as we get uh, later into this uh, topic, which you'll find fascinating, that the Spirit is of Jesus or of the Father and not its own individual. If you say it's the Spirit of person, it's the person of the Father or of the Son, but it is not its own individual. Why did I come to that conclusion? We'll talk more about that as we get into the the uh, future chapters, but it, to me, the biggest thing is that the spirit has no name, and uh, you you name something that has individuality. That's why the Father has a name, Yahweh, and Jesus has his name, the Son. And um, when we look into the scriptures, I want to just make sure that I explain that clearly: that Yahweh is the name of God the Father. Um, Yahweh is not a term for the Trinity of three in one into one name. And um, I explain this, we go through Psalm 110.1, which is the most quoted uh, Old Testament verse in the New Testament. And it says that uh, in, in the translation that I'll read is the World English Bible because they use the name of Yahweh. It says, Yahweh says to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool for your feet. So here we have Yahweh. Yahweh says to the Lord. It's a picture, I believe, of Yahweh saying to his son Jesus, the anointed one, and saying to him, sit at my right hand, which is a place of authority and power, till I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. And so, again, Jesus was quoting this. This was the Psalm 110.1 was the last uh, verse that Jesus quoted to the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And it was so convincing. I love what it says is, is it silenced them. They no longer had any arguments whatsoever um, when Jesus made that statement. And so as we look into the, the next lesson, we're going to be talking about the angel of the Lord. And I hope that this talk on monotheism uh, is helpful to you. And again, you'll see that tension between Deuteronomy 6.4 and John 3.16. Because here you have the Jewish people saying God is one, but then you have the, uh, the introduction of a father sending his son. That's two. So we see that um, when we embrace the idea of the two powers in heaven, uh, I believe that the Jewish establishment in the times of Jesus, they were expecting the role that Jesus 
uh, fulfilled as he came. And there was great expectation for this other power to come. And I think if we hold to monotheism in a, in a strict manner, like the later uh, rabbinical Jews began to hold to, that's what caused the Christians to react and say, no, God is one, instead of realizing he's not one as a number, but he's one as a God of covenant. He's a jealous God. He wants to bring you and I in the covenant, just like Jesus and the Father are in covenant together. And I think talking about monotheism may be controversial for some people, but I think it's important that when we think deeply, we have to address everything that we believe. When it comes down to monotheism, when it comes down to the Trinity, we need to have honest conversations because we can't just settle with beliefs because we uh, are told this is what we have to believe or this is what um, you know everyone's believed for all these years. Uh, though there, there's validity to historical uh, confidence in certain beliefs and doctrines, I agree with that. But the ultimate source of truth is the scriptures. <laughs> we have to believe in the power of God and the scriptures or we will be in error. So what I am trying to do to the best of my knowledge, the best of my skills, is to present to you the idea of the two powers in heaven, which I believe fits very well as we transition from the Old to the New Testament. And I believe historically, you're going to find that this was the model that many Jewish people believed who later became uh, ones who accepted Jesus in that role of the other power in heaven, the Son of Man, the Messiah. So as we journey into our next session on the angel of the Lord, um, continue to study, pray, and ask God to enlighten you on, in his word. God bless. Why do you find that countless times in the Bible, God himself actually changes someone's name? We find that Jesus changes Simon's name to Peter. We find Jacob struggling with an angel and saying, what is your name? The Bible itself has over 40,000 names of persons, of places. And what I've done is I've taken the 3,250 different names in the Bible and I've placed their meaning right next to the actual proper name in the scriptures. And this project has taken me five years to complete and it's called the Name Translation Bible. As a pastor, I want you to go deeper into the Word of God. And I'm giving you a tool that will save you time, save you effort, and allow you to get the greatest revelation, the deepest revelation possible as you study God's Word. We look forward to you going deeper into the Word of God through the Name Translation Bible. God bless.